choice. Our children. Our choice. These parents don't want their children taught about same-sex relationships. It's a conflict between religion and education, a deep divide between parents and the school. The last major holdout on LGBT is the Muslim world. And the powers that be in the West are asking one question. How do we get Muslims to accept homosexuality and the gay and trans lifestyle? The answer to this question is clear for them because they have used a strategy to get America and Europe to accept LGBT. Two gay media strategists, Marshall Kirk and Hunter Madsen, developed a six-point plan for what they called overhauling straight America. This strategy they published in 1987 and was later developed into a larger book called After the Ball. The purpose of this strategy was to mainstream LGBT. And the strategy was so successful that within 20 years, they were able to turn a deeply conservative Christian country, the United States, into a country that celebrates openly every aspect of the LGBT ideology. Now we see the same exact strategy with some slight modifications being used on the Muslim world. And if we allow this strategy to play out and be executed, then it's likely that the Muslim world will adopt and celebrate LGBT even faster than it was accepted in the West. So what are the components of this six point plan? Point number one, talk about gays and homosexuality as much as possible, as loudly as possible. The goal is to desensitize. You want to make homosexuality something that is seen as completely normal, something that is completely mainstream. And you want the public to not be shocked by homosexual or transgender behavior. Ideally, they want Muslims to think about sexual preference in the way that you think about flavors of ice cream or favorite sports. I like chocolate, she likes ice cream. I like cricket, he likes football. I'm heterosexual, she's homosexual. This is the kind of normality that they're aiming for. Key to desensitization is to introduce gay and trans elements through cultural venues, TV, movies, music, books and that way you're going to accelerate the desensitization and the normalization process. Point number two, this is critical. You have to portray gays as victims, not as aggressive challengers. There is a huge non-bullying campaign. The point of these anti-bullying campaigns is to portray gays as victims who need protection and they need support. In this way, the homosexual is transformed in the mind of a Muslim. In the mind of a Muslim, homosexuality is associated with Qawm Lut, and they were by no means victims. They were in fact the aggressor. But through an anti-bullying message, the homosexual is transformed into an innocent victim and indeed a symbol of innocence in need of protection. Point number three, give the protectors a just cause. So anyone who's outside of the newly identified victims, the LGBT community, takes on this protector role. They need a just cause that they can rally behind. What is this just cause? You can make it about diversity, and this is something that Muslims already value because of Islam. You can also give Muslims the just cause of protecting rights. Muslims are not going to support the homosexual act itself. So that has to be decentered. By focusing on anti-discrimination, no longer is homosexuality about men penetrating each other's rectums in a kind of sexual fetish. That's not a cause that anyone would get behind. In fact, it's a cause that Muslims would be repulsed by and would reject. But if you change the conversation to be about anti-discrimination and something positive, like the fight for liberty, the fight for rights, then that becomes a positive message that Muslims 
might be more inclined to support. Point number four is really subtle. Emphasize that homosexual behavior is haram. Now this might seem counterintuitive. If you focus on the haram aspect, it makes you seem like you're a staunch defender of Islamic values. This then gives you space to promote anti-bullying or even all out support of LGBT rights. This is a kind of Trojan horse that fools the Muslim community into thinking that LGBT behavior is haram, but supporting LGBT rights is perfectly halal and permissible and even praiseworthy in Islam, when in reality nothing could be further from the truth. Preachers and academics in the West have been using this strategy for over 10 years and what they've been able to achieve is getting the Muslim community in America especially to be more open to the idea that it is permissible for Muslims to support LGBT rights and to align with a LGBT political program. Now, those same preachers and their message is being exported throughout the Muslim world. This idea is slowly starting to creep into mainstream Islamic Orthodox discourse. Point number five, make the victimizer look bad. Make those who oppose LGBT as oppressors who are old, they're out of touch, they're on the wrong side of history, they don't get it, they are intolerant, they are bigots. This is an important part of this victimized oppressor dynamic that is the framing of the entire LGBT proliferation movement that you want to create in the Muslim world. If this marketing campaign is successful, then the average Muslim will not want to associate with anyone who is anti-LGBT or in any way opposes that program. At first, this will create a culture of silence where the average Muslim doesn't want to risk speaking out and looking like a bigot or being accused of intolerance. Eventually, that culture of silence will allow the full LGBT program to get into full swing. Mereka menjadikan topik berkaitan dengan gay itu satu perkara yang normal. Kita tidak cukup lantang untuk bersuara menentang kemaksiatan ini.